Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Demystifying Egg Freezing and Debunking Misconceptions. I'm Holly McHugh, I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at FCI, and I'm really excited to be here today with you. We have some really great information and a really great panel to share that information with you. Before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over. A recording of this webinar will be available on demand. So you will receive an email with the recording after this webinar. It will also be on our website and YouTube pages. And we really would love to hear from you during this webinar. There is a Q&A button. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. And we do ask that you keep your questions open-ended. And if you have anything that is really specific to you, we do ask that you schedule a um, appointment with a, with a physician. And we encourage you to follow us on social media. Our doctors are always sharing really useful information about topics like ways to improve your chances of conceiving, what to expect when undergoing treatment and so much more. And then finally, um, we will be selecting 10 attendees to win a free consultation and $500 off of egg storage um, after this webinar. If you do have any questions about that, we do ask that you go to our website. All of the guidelines are available there. During this webinar, we are going to give you a quick intro to FCI if you're not super familiar with us already. We'll also talk about the basics of egg freezing. We're going to talk about the top five myths debunked, so the facts about what egg freezing is and what it isn't. We'll go through the egg freezing process, and like I mentioned, we will answer your questions at the end. We have, like I said, a really great panel here today. We have our hosts, Dr. Hirschfeld Zitron and Dr. Channing Birch Chapman, our fertility specialist. We have Amber Kitty. She is a fertility nurse practitioner. Rose Gallucci, our senior revenue cycle manager. She'll be taking you through the financial aspects of egg freezing. Unfortunately, our um, patient was not able to join us today. Something came up but we will have an opportunity for you to still ask her your questions. So when that email goes out that I mentioned earlier about, um, about uh, or sorry, not about, with our um, webinar recording, um, you will have a link in there to submit your questions and she'll be answering the top 10 questions she's asked and we'll be posting that on our blog. So keep an eye out for that. We encourage you to ask her your questions. And we um, also have a really great podcast that's live right now. If you go onto our blog with a patient, Rachel, it's a really great resource. She asks many common questions as well. And it also features Dr. Hirschfeld Citron. So before we get started, a little bit about FCI. We have 11 physicians across eight locations throughout the Chicagoland area. We have locations in River North, Glenview, Buffalo Grove, Hoffman Estates, Hinsdale, Highland Park, Warrenville, and Tinley Park. And we have also been serving the community for 35 plus years. And we've had 42,000 babies born through FCI services. We are really excited to talk to you about egg freezing today. We are um, a leader in egg, we've been a leader in egg freezing since 2004. We've frozen over 17,000 eggs, and that's more than any clinic in the Midwest. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Hirschfeld Sitron and Dr. Channing Burke Chapman, who will walk you through starting with the um, egg freezing 101, so the basics about egg freezing. I think Dr. Hirschfeld, or sorry, Dr. Ch Chapman is uh, kicking us off. 
Unmuting. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. As Holly said, I'm Dr. Jane Briggs Chapman, and Dr. Hirschfeld and I are really excited about the opportunity just to talk to you guys about egg freezing and to answer any questions that you might have. Um, next slide. So yes, thank you. We're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled for you all to be here. Um, so we're hoping to hit many of the highlights and then be able to use the Q&A to hone in on what really remains questions for each and all of you. So just to start, what is egg freezing? So the goal of egg freezing, of course, is to keep your fertility potential at its current state. A cohort or a group of eggs that otherwise go unused each month are what are stimulated to grow and mature. These eggs are then removed from the ovaries and frozen to be used at a later time. So the way I always think of this is like every month, you have like a high school class of a number of available eggs potentially to ovulate. Your body chooses one. So if your high school class is 10 kids, one is the valedictorian, that's the one that ovulates. The other nine that month, so to speak, failed the class. And in a normal cycle, they would die off in atresia. When we do egg freezing, I'm a little morbid, sorry for that. But if we do egg freezing, we get all of these follicles or eggs to grow. And so we get those 10 contenders to grow as a group. And I just wanna highlight that because a lot of questions patients will ask me is, does that mean you've diminished my ability to conceive on my own doing egg freezing? And the answer to that is no. We have in a sense, better utilize eggs that otherwise would be lost. So uh, next slide, Holly, thank you. Okay, so why do women freeze their eggs? So simply, as Dr. Hirschfeld just stated, it's because it's a way for them to preserve their fertility. Um, freeze eggs now in their current state, it provides you with an insurance policy to use it in the future, just in case you may need to use them to have a baby. So women who are freezing their eggs, they typically fall under two categories. One, elective freezing. This is typically women who are single, um, who either may not have a partner or they have a partner that they're not sure if it's going to result in a lifelong relationship where they're going to get married or have kids. Um, another big reason is because they want to further their education or they're establishing their career. So we do not want women to feel so pressured by this biological um, time clock that we unfortunately all share. We want you to feel as if you can have your career and have a family. We want you to be able to have both. Um, and then finally, the last um, category is women who undergo egg freezing due to a medical condition. This typically is women who have cancer who are trying to preserve their fertility before starting either chemo or radiation. So depending on the type of drug that might be used and the duration of the treatment that can potentially be detrimental to your fertility. Next slide. So just a little bit of lingo. And so these terms get really confusing. So hopefully this is a helpful reference. So oocyte or egg are one and the same. A follicle is an egg surrounded by nurse cells. I will tell you, most of us use the terms oocyte, follicles, and eggs interchangeably, but just to know. An embryo is when an egg has been fertilized with sperm. Vitrification is the fast freeze. So this is what came on the scene probably about now eight to 10 years ago and completely changed our capacity to freeze eggs. Prior to this, it was something called slow freezing that's just less effective with eggs than it was with embryos based on the higher water content of an egg. And then a blastocyst. A blastocyst is a fertilized egg that has become an embryo that develops to five days. The blastocyst is the phase that in the future, when women who have frozen their eggs come to use those eggs to create a pregnancy, that is the phase that the embryo is placed back into the cavity. So it's a day five embryo. Next slide, Holly. Okay, so now we're gonna go over kind of the top five myths about egg freezing. We're gonna go through them one by one. Next slide. I am going to cover myth number one, which is egg freezing is a brand new technology. Next slide. So I think this is all about context. So I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time on this slide because I feel it's important. So let's go back. So first live birth from in vitro fertilization or IVF was in 1971. Um, live birth from frozen egg, first live birth was 1986. So egg freezing was first traditionally used for cancer patients. We just talked about that. People who are trying to preserve the fertility before undergoing cancer treatment. 
Now, as the demand for egg freezing increased, as Dr. Hirschfeld just mentioned, there was a shift in technology that we used to freeze eggs. We went from slow freeze to fast freeze, saw better success rates. This led to um, a huge increase in egg freezing, so elective for elective reasons, but also led to the emergence of donor egg banks. So the first donor egg bank in the United States is Donor Egg Bank USA. It's known as W. I'm proud to tell you that FCI was a founding partner of W, and we are the only clinic in the Midwest that they partner with. Now, why is this important? It's important because as a W partner, our lab goes, undergoes additional scrutiny and quality assurance measures. Our success rates are closely monitored. So the fertilization and live birth rates of every team member in our lab are monitored. If any team member falls below that high level of standard, they undergo additional training. Now, since eggs are structurally more fragile than embryos, it's very important that the lab um, at which you complete egg freezing has a high level of experience and expertise handling, freezing, and thawing eggs when you're ready to use them. This can directly impact your success and your likelihood of bringing home the baby that you so much desire. Next slide. So the number of women, um, as I said, who have undergone egg freezing has increased significantly. Since 2009, we have seen almost a 2,700% increase. This is not only um, due to our improved technology, but also because of increased awareness surrounding fertility. As you many, many of you might know, many celebrities are now also opening up again about their experiences. Um, one of the most notoriable might be Khloe Kardashian, and I think that we are just very thankful to them for being advocates and helping to promote fertility awareness, whether their experience was positive or negative. Next slide. Yeah, thanks, Holly. So I'll be taking myth two. So myth two is this idea that you can freeze your eggs at any age and expect the same result. Um, and unfortunately, that is not the case. So in every way, you know, 40 is the new 50, 30 is the new 40, how women live our lives and the longevity of our life and potentially our capacity to carry a pregnancy. But our eggs sort of haven't caught up to that trend. And they're still really fixed in this idea that our fertility peaks in our late 20s. And so quality diminishes with time. And the way we compensate for this so that egg freezing can be an option for women of various ages into our late 20s, 30s, early 40s becomes quantity which is something we'll sort of get at, that the number of eggs that we, you'll need to freeze to have success will increase for women as we get older. And so why is it that, you know, fertility still kind of is fixed in this idea of peaking in our late 20s and 30s? This is because women are born um, with a fixed number of eggs. At birth, we have one to two million eggs. By age 30, we only have 12% of those left. What is interesting in our fetal life, we actually have the most eggs. At 40, we only have 3% of the eggs that remain. Go oh, next slide. And so I think that is why fertility awareness is so important. So exactly what Dr. Burke said said, celebrities such as Khloe Kardashian um, and others have brought to the forefront this idea that our fertility is fixed with time. And so if you wanna make changes and consider egg freezing, you should be aware one, that that exists, two, there's options or treatments like egg freezing, um, and three, that fertility does have a, have a finite component if it's important of a biologically connected child. And so first of this just simply starts with awareness. I think what is so interesting, this is a survey that you see before, almost half of women are unaware that fertility rates decline between the ages of 30 and 45. I think people always use this number of 35. Like before 35, everything is fine. And 35 in one day, everything has, has gone downhill. And like anything else, it's like a gradation, right? So in our late twenties, it's less within our early 30s becomes a bit steeper and our late 30s, early 40s becomes even more steeper in terms of our egg quality. Not capacity to carry, that's totally different. You could carry even when you're menopausal. Using eggs, either of a younger woman or if you've frozen your own eggs, your own eggs from when you were younger, which is really the whole power and I think kind of the amazing piece of this. Um, over half of women over 35 said they would have made a different decision regarding their decisions in terms of egg freeze and when they have a family. Um, with better fertility education in their youth. And so although we can't change high school health classes, I think the idea of forums like this is to encourage all of you who are listening, your friends, family members, and your sisters 
to just bring about this awareness. I mean, there's definitely more on social media, but there always can be more. Next slide. So then we take the next step. So again, our age is really linked to ed quality, but quantity that like high school class that I referenced varies from person to person. So we want to learn if you did egg freezing, how many eggs would you likely get? Because that's key in deciding how you want to go forward if you're someone that may need more than one cycle. And so the way that we determine it is a series of tests. So the first one is called an antral follicle count. And so that's a vaginal ultrasound that's done. And we count the number of small follicles, which again are those eggs surrounded by nurse cells in the early cycle. We do a blood test at the same time. We screen a hormone called your FSH. That is a hormone that gauges, again, this idea of ovarian reserve. At the same time, we look at your estrogen. And we look at a level called your AMH. Of the three blood tests, the AMH is probably the most predictive. In terms of the most predictive to determine egg number of retrieval, it's probably our antral follicle count. And the way that I view it when I talk to patients is we really want a global perspective. We don't want to just tunnel vision, look at one or two of these. We want to look at all of them to really make a decision about this is our projected yield. This is our best dosing of medication. Next slide. Okay, so myth number three. I only need one egg to conceive a baby. Um, next slide, Holly. So although we wish this was the case, it just is not true. So unfortunately, not every egg will result in a pregnancy. There are many steps involved between egg and baby, and unfortunately, not every egg will successfully make it through each step. So first, an egg must survive the warming process. It has to be successfully fertilized by a sperm in order to create an embryo. An embryo must develop into a day five embryo that Dr. Hirschfeld told us earlier is called a blastocyst. That is the stage where we then transfer that embryo into your uterus, and then we have to then hope that we achieve a pregnancy. So a drop-off at each step is not only normal, it's expected. So that is why it's important to know at the beginning how many eggs should you freeze based on your age. Dr. Hirschfeld also kind of just alluded to, like, what is the age impact? So it impacts quantity, the number of eggs, and also the quality of eggs. So compared to younger women, um, women in their late 30s, early 40s have an increased percentage of genetically abnormal eggs. So that's why we'll, generally speaking, recommend if you're less than 35, freezing 12 to 15 eggs to have a high probability of having one child. As opposed to if you are 38, when you undergo egg freezing, you probably need double that number um, in order to have that same likelihood of having one child. On average, women get nine to 10 eggs per egg freezing cycle. However, this varies greatly based on your own individual ovarian reserve. So you might get more than 10, especially if you are a younger woman or if you have high ovarian reserve, if you have lower ovarian reserve, you might get less than 10. So hopefully you can achieve your number, your goal number of eggs in one cycle. But the truth is, honestly, many people might have to do more than one cycle. And that is especially true if they want to have an insurance policy for more than one baby. Next slide. Myth number four, which really builds upon what Dr. Brooks was saying, if I freeze my eggs, then future success is guaranteed. Next slide, please. And so this becomes a visual to kind of reinforce this idea that this study looked at 38, most look at 35. I think there was a question, how many I need at various ages? <laughs> Those are the exact things we go through with you at your own consult, but there's definitely, there's sort of like calendars out there. There's estimated um, websites that can help gauge based on the studies that have been done. If I'm 36, it's 20. If I'm 35, it's 12 or 15. Um, I think the key piece today is just to highlight the age we are is going to dictate how many we need and how effective they will be. And so if we look at this as a visual, and we'll, people are always surprised, 12 to 15, at age 35 for one child. And the unfortunate piece is yes. If we look here in the slide that shows us women less than 38, as an example, let's say you had 10 eggs, nine of those thaw. So these are not just random numbers, these are kind of the expected percentages. Six to seven embryos created. Two of those are high quality embryos. Each of those has a likelihood of creating pregnancy 50% of the time. So your 10 eggs gave you two tries, each creating 50%. So there's like cumulative goals 
um, is this idea of how many do I need cumulatively is now based on data that we have looking at many women that then increase and how many that were needed at various ages. But this kind of gives you that sense of, oh my gosh, how did 10 become two? Same when we're 38 to 40, now 15 become two. So 15, 13 um, survived the thaw. So you can see it's, it's 13 to 15 versus nine of 10. So the percentage is a little bit different. Eight of nine of those become embryos. Of those we expect too high quality. How we're defining high quality is sort of subtle, but at age 38, if we don't do different selection tools, the embryos themselves have a lower likelihood of creating pregnancy. So this just again highlights at age 38, we don't want 15. We don't want just those two tries. We're gonna want to she had identified more towards 30. Um, and so I think that the key piece of these slides and this kind of information is saying, okay, I know now based on my age, how many I probably need and how many I'm likely gonna get. And I need to ask myself, what is the goal? So if what we're describing is like the platinum plan of insurances, like anything else, whether it's our car, most of us don't get the platinum plan, it's the gold or the silver. But what's so important is you knew before you left, okay, this was my objective, this was what I've achieved. And I know the likelihood of success as I go forward in my life. I think what we really want as a field is that women do not feel misled. There was a criticism in the past. To give you a perspective of our clinic, so we have described that we have frozen over 17,000 eggs, which really is extraordinary. We have thawed 1,400, and we see a pregnancy success of 55 to 60% per transfer. So our average age, I think, is about 37. So again, we are seeing equal pregnancy success of an egg that initially was frozen from one that was fresh. That is so, so key wherever you go. You need to make sure that they can tell you that because otherwise, but nobody wants us to freeze their eggs. Um, next slide. So myth number five is that all fertility clinics are equipped to do egg freezing. Next slide. So I think we've both alluded to this, but it's worth repeating because it truly is so important. The level of experience that a fertility clinic and their lab have with egg freezing and thawing can directly impact your outcome. We strongly, strongly recommend that if you are considering egg freezing, that you ask your fertility doctor at, their, at your consultation, number one, what is your lab's experience with egg freezing and thawing? And even more importantly, number two, how many live births have you had from egg freezing, right? Because that's the end goal. It's not just to have success from egg freezing and I did egg freezing and I got 15 eggs. It's, all, it's how many live births have you had? How many of your women freeze their eggs? Then they come back later to use them and they end up with a baby. So other important questions, what technology does your lab use? We kind of mentioned that fast freeze has had better success in studies than slow freezing. Um, where will my eggs be stored at once they're frozen? And have you ever uh, helped patients to transport them? So say, you know, later down the road, you move to a new city, you have a new job. How easy is it going to be for you to transport those eggs from that first city to the next city? Next slide. Um, now we are going to get into the egg freezing experience. Um, I think Dr. Um, yeah, so here's sort of a timeline um, just to kind of put all this into perspective. The way I, I sort of view it, so cycle one, like you saw us, you did your testing, typically days two, three, four, potentially within the same month that you saw us we meet again. So with that second month, so if month A is testing, month B could be treatment like an egg freezing cycle. Logistically, what this can look like um, is in some cases, women are placed on birth control pills. In our practice, we are part of a very large IVF center, which has the advantage that we don't batch um, our retrieval so that a patient can really start treatment any day. So it allows us to avoid birth control pills. And in my personal experience, that's a benefit because birth control pills can suppress your body and negatively impact your yield. The stimulation, the actual time you're taking the medications, on average is somewhere 10 to 12 days. So that's somewhere like six visits. So you're, you chose the month, okay, my life is easiest in March. I got my period March 2nd. I started my medicines March 4th. On average, it's, four, it's 10 days. I'm coming with ultras on a blood work to assess my growth every other day and I'm giving myself injection medicines to drive those eggs to grow. 
on average, after 10 days, we're able to say, okay, we're in a really good place. We're gonna give a final medicine to mature those eggs. Exactly 36 hours later is the retrieval. So you have two days knowledge when you need a full day off from the anesthetic. A 10 minute procedure, that under anesthesia like twilight, like if you're having a colonoscopy or wisdom teeth, it's still, it's enough sedation that I always say you should not do heavy lifting like cognitively or physically, you should not drive, you should really have a trusted driver and avoid a riding service just because we would be at a vulnerable state if we had that um, treatment. Um, after the egg retrieval, later that day, uh, the eggs, after they've been equilibrated, the nurse cells that surround the egg are removed and we're able to assess the maturity. Those eggs that are mature are able to be frozen. It takes about a week and a half for the ovaries to get big. And on the back end, it takes a week and a half for them to get smaller. We know that's occurred because your period comes. Next slide. Oh, great. Thank you, Dr. Hirschfeld. Yes. Well, I did, uh, I um, oh, sorry, I just, because I had wanted to just take the opportunity. Amber is really one of our senior and most experienced and most successful exceptional nurses. Um, so we're so lucky to have her. Sorry, I didn't mean to up, Holly. Um, I just wanted to say that we're really lucky that she's joining us today because um, she's so good at what she does and she's just incredibly lovely. Thank you. That is a great introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Amber. Katie, she is one of our fertility nurse practitioners, and she is going to talk about her role in the egg freezing process. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hirschfeld. That was really kind. Um, I'm excited to be here and talk about um, kind of what, what gets started. Dr. Hirschfeld really uh, reviewed a lot of it, and um, you know the, the physicians are there to, to guide the ship. And then you have um, the phlebotomy team, the ultrasound team, the schedulers, and the nurses to help guide you through that the rest of that process. So you'll meet with the physician first, um, and then you'll meet with the, the nurse afterwards. And right now we're doing that all through Zoom, so you'll likely get a call and then also a, an email or a message in our portal to review your next steps so that you can see, oh, this is what I need to do, this is where I need to be, this is what I need to send. So it is intimidating, you know, all of the things that we have to get organized, um, but you have your own liaison through the process, which is really helpful. Um, so we, we start with your checklist. So that's the initial labs that the physician has ordered um, to help gauge your overall global perspective of, of what your potential is and what we think that your future uh, treatment plan should be. And, um, and then once you get started, we'll be organizing your next steps. Every time you come in, you should be hearing from a nurse or a team member to tell you, okay, this is what I do next. This is what I do next. Um, we give you a big over picture, but it's also nice to have that guidance because it's, it's easy to, um, there's a lot of little parts that go into it, um, such as making sure that you have your breast exam and making sure you have your pap smear on file so that we can go through and make sure as healthy as possible before we do the, the uh, um, treatment. So the nurse is really there to help guide you. And, um, you know, if we talk with the physicians. If you have a question that, that needs to be escalated, uh, we can help you with that. Um, the physicians are always reviewing anything that we've reviewed with you. And um, we're really there as a resource. So I, I encourage you to utilize us um, in your process. And the, and the nursing practice makes a difference where you go to make sure that you have that team rooting for you. Next slide. So for the egg freezing checklist, um, we have a pap smear and a breast exam. Again, this is just to make sure that you're as healthy as possible before we start you on, on hormones um, and before we get you through this process. Um, if, if there is any medical reason that, that would inhibit um, or affect your cycle, we need to make sure that we talk with that physician. For example, if you have hypertension, we want to make sure that you're on the right medication um, during the IVF process, during um, taking medications to make sure that that's managed because we are going to put you under light anesthesia. We want to make sure that you're going to be healthy and safe and ready to go for that. Um, and then we will we'll get you started. You come in with your period um, and and get all of your workup done. Once your workup is complete, then you're gonna meet back with the physician and get a game plan. With that game plan, now we're gonna order medications. We're gonna make sure that your checklist is complete. We're going to make sure you have consents and you, you know what the game plan is, that we've reviewed each step of that. 
um, and make sure that you have the financial authorization um, and that you're, you're financially prepared to take on the next step. Um, consents are important, of course, and your nurse will help go through uh, the nuances. You know, we have lots of eggs now. What are we going to do if, if something happens to us? What are we going to do if we need to move? Things to think about. Um, and your nurse is there to talk about your options and, and um, kind of brainstorm if, if you have questions about that. And you're, I mean, your physicians are there too, so they can always help you with that too. Next slide. So for the medications, um, we do, we usually, we take one cycle to prime you to quiet your hormones before starting stimulation so that the hormones that you're taking every night are more effective and can be used. So e for each person, your priming meds will be a little bit different. And that depends on your age and your, your, um, your personal history, you know, it, what is your AMH? Where are you at kind of in this process? So the nice thing is that we don't have to put every patient on birth control. We're not, we don't have to get you into a series. Um, we can use other things to prime you so that it's not as suppressive as birth control, like Dr. Hirschfeld said. And then, um, then we'll go ahead and stimulate your ovaries with your period. And there's a few medications that we use for that, like Folistim, Gonal F, Menopure, low dose HCG, um, Clomid, and then growth hormone. You know, there's a few here and there and, and the physicians will go through which one will work best for you. But these are stimulation medications to make sure that all of those, all of the cohort, not just one makes it to the end, but all of them graduate together. All of them become the valedictorian. And so uh, when you're in monitoring, those medications are gonna be adjusted and you're gonna be working with a fertility pharmacy to make sure that you have these ordered and to make sure that, that you know you have the right one that the physician's ordered, or if, if your insurance doesn't cover that one, that we can, we can switch that out, that sort of thing. And your nurse is gonna help you with um, organizing that. And then when your eggs are ready, so we have the most mature eggs looking between somewhere between 18 and 22, anything above 15 we're excited about, um, doctor will say, okay, it's time to trigger. And um, again, your trigger is gonna be dependent on how your body's responding to medications and your specific uh, situation. So it depends, but generally you will do a Lupron trigger or an HCG trigger. Um, and that's a one time, that's a very specific, we'll say, okay, take it tonight at a specific time. And then 36 to, to 40 hours later, you'll do your retrieval. Uh, we may, the doctor may add in some stimulation medications the night of retrieval that can be normal to make sure that they get the extra boost they need. Uh, we do antibiotics uh, prophylactically before we go in for a procedure. Um, and we may add some other medications like um, steroids or that sort of thing, depending on your situation to make sure and ensure you have the best outcome possible. Next Thank you, Amber. Um, so that was such great information. We are going to transition to another really important topic, egg freezing finance. We want you to be aware of all of the opportunities that are available to you and our um, senior cycle manager, Rose, is going to walk you through some of the costs and um, financing options available. Hello, everyone. Um, the following will be some basic financial information um, that will help understand what covers and what doesn't cover treatment. So insurance. Um, Illinois is a mandated state for fertility coverage. Um, however, you may not be employed by a company that is based out of Illinois, so you may not have that coverage. You also may have coverage that covers for diagnosis, uh, diagnostic type of um, services and not treatment, or you may have the full package. Um, things to think about is even though you may have what they consider full coverage, you still will have either a deductible, deductible with co-pays, and most of all insurances have a coverage max, which they refer to either lifetime max or calendar max or service year uh, max. Some insurance companies that we do deal with um, require pre-authorization. And if we do not obtain that, we don't get paid for the service. And that sometimes can take up to 15 business days with specific payers. Next slide, please. Some of the financial options. So the covering costs when you're paying out of pocket, um, our goal here at FCI 
is to offer you our expertise through every step of your journey. So what we first do in the central business office here is we assign you a financial coordinator. Um, every physician has their own financial coordinators assigned to them. And this will help you with answering any questions. Um, they will make sure that they verify the insurance is verified, any authorization that is needed, so forth and so on. If you do not have insurance um, that covers fertility, we also explore other payment programs. So obviously there's always the self-pay. We do have self-pay um, programs and, and pricing, but we also do have programs and discounts that will help you with the, the total cost. Um, there also are grants available, and we also do partner with different lending companies that are specific um, to fertility. Next slide, please. So the financial considerations um, and the nurses, and I know Amber, you went through all of this, um, is the ovarian function testing with your consult the egg freezing cycle options, your medication and your storage, and then the using of your frozen eggs for pregnancy. So how much does it cost? So if you were paying out of pocket, self-pay, and you needed to come in for the female fertility testing, now this is for freezing only, it would run about $500, and this would include the different blood tests and the ultrasound um, that Amber went through on prior uh, slides. The actual egg retrieval procedure, which is also known and sometimes we refer to as EGVIT, um, these packages here include, it's the full package. It includes your cycle management, your monitoring, any labs that you may need, your office visits, and the actual procedure of the egg retrieval, including anesthesia and your cryopreservation with a year storage. So your single cycle will cost $7,500. But we also do have prepaid cycles, um, which if you're considering, you know ahead of time that you may want to do more than one cycle. We offer a prepaid cycle uh, with two cycles that is at 12,500. And then our prepaid for three cycles is 16,500. This does not include medication. Your medication for each cycle, depending on your needs and what your physician recommends, it can run from $3,000 to $5,000. Um, however, sometimes if you don't have fertility coverage, the, your insurance may cover your medication under your medical part. Um, so that's also something that we would look into for you. If you needed additional, let's say you wanted to do extra cycles, um, for every time we do a procedure, we always include the cryopreservation, because you must have that, of $850. And then beyond that, your additional storage for your eggs, no matter how many you have, is $675 yearly. We also do offer a quarterly program should you think you're going to use them sooner and you don't want to waste the 12 months. We do quarterly at three months at a time. Next slide. Oh, I'm done. Great. Hey. So, um, thank you, Rose. Um, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for providing all of those great insights. We are going to open up the floor to questions now. I see we have some coming in already. Um, I'm gonna kick this off with Amber. I have a question for you. Um, how do the shots and the medications affect your hormones and mood? It's a great question. It's something that every woman goes through when they're on these medications. Um, so with IVF medications, with injectable medications, uh, you're taking around the same dose every night consistently for 10 to 14 days. So uh, generally, I don't hear as many complaints um, as opposed to oral medications like uh, Clomid or Letrozole because we're kind of keeping you as stable as possible. Uh, that being said, everyone's a little bit um, different uh, response to estrogen. And so sometimes you can have hormonal changes. It's very normal. Um, but the one, the one thing that you do want to also manage, it, it, 
sometimes the, the stress and the going through this process adds to it. So it may not just be the medications, it may be stress management, because again, we're taking away your ability to exercise during stimulation. Uh, we're telling you, you need to come in every other day. So your schedule is disrupted. So really um, what's nice about the egg freezing is that you have a lot of control about when you decide to come in um, and, and other options for stress management um, and acupuncture and lots of other things that we can help control um, in a situation that feels kind of uncontrollable. Uh, you, have, you have the power to decide, you know, when is gonna be less stressful for your, you know, you're a tax person and you're, it's tax season, that may not be the time to do your egg freezing. You may wanna do that at a different time to help reduce that stress. And then you may not notice as many side effects. Um, it's not always the medication that causes that. So um, hopefully with stress management and consistent medications, you usually don't notice as many issues. Thank you, Amber. And this is for Dr. Burks. Um, how long does it take to feel back to normal post-op? So I think it's a little different for everyone, but mostly it depends on um, the medications that we use to stimulate your ovaries and also what trigger we used um, before your retrieval. Um, but I would say generally, um, most people feel back to normal after one to two weeks. The ovaries have really decreased in size, um, but just from the procedure itself, I would say people really kind of feel a little crampy, might feel a little groggy from anesthesia, but the day after surgery, they feel much better. And then another like seven to 10 days, up to two weeks max to really feel all the way back to normal. Thank you. Um, let's see, this, I'm not sure if um, Dr. Hirschfeld or Dr. Burks or who um, would be the best person to answer this, but other supplements you can take to um, improve fertility? Um, so I can take this. I, I would say that a lot of the quote unquote like supplements that people think of have really been utilized not as much in egg freezing, but in embryo development. Uh, so I, I just with a caveat before you start taking a laundry list of things like from blog or uh, a social media post, I would just be hesitant. Many supplements have in them a sort of proprietary blends and how those blends interact theoretically with the egg freezing medications can be unpredictable. I usually recommend that you take almost nothing um, besides like prescription medications, but minimal of supplements um, when we're doing egg freezing. What's probably even more important than the supplements we take is how we live our lives. So there's no question that the most nutrition you get is when you ingest food more than a supplement. That's when the gut gets its most blood supply, and you're able to get really the benefits of things like antioxidants. And so the best way to achieve that is to like eat the rainbow when we think of fruits and vegetables, get most of our calories from fruits and vegetables, lean meats, and complex carbohydrates like brown rices and quinoa, try to minimize alcohol use, minimize caffeine, the notion of moderation. So be of healthy weight, be active on a regular basis. So living your life in that capacity probably is the best for our eggs more than anything else. Um, the most important predictor for, for talk about is age. None of us can change our age, but we can change our weight theoretically. We can change our lifestyle. We can quit tobacco use. We can minimize alcohol. And that would be what I would suggest more than taking a series of supplements. Great, thank you. Uh, Rose, this is for you. How do I find out if my insurance covers egg freezing? So offhand, um, I do know that Almost all the payers that we have do not cover for the egg freezing and you have to pay out of pocket unless of course you're a cancer patient. So even though fertility has come a long way with insurance and some states mandate are mandated, um, it doesn't cover for the cryo and the storage unless you're an oncology patient. Well, the, Rose, there are some payers like Progeny um, and others that are contributing towards egg freezing. Progeny, yes, if you're, if you have the progeny coverage, but if you have your typical, just your UHC, Blue Cross, um, Aetna, Cigna, um, they typically do not. Thank you. Um, Dr. Burks, um, can being diagnosed with PCOS affect my chances of being able to freeze my eggs successfully?
Um, so we do a lot of egg freezing in women with PCOS. It's the process of stimulating your eggs would be very similar if you were undergoing IVF in order to freeze embryos. So it just depends on your ovarian reserve, what your AMH is, um, no different than anyone else. We would make an individualized plan for you as far as what doses of medications we would give um, and to try to ensure that we <clears throat> get the kind of the most out of that cohort of eggs that you have every month. Um, one thing it can put you at risk for are women with PCOS tend to be what we call hyper responders, meaning they, their ovaries, they have a lot of follicles, they might um, respond vigorously to our medication. So we're very particular about the doses that we use. And then we often use a certain trigger um, called Lupron in order to decrease your risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. But it, just because you have PCS, there's no reason why you can't freeze your eggs and be successful. Uh, Dr. Hirschfeld Citron, what's the what are the pros and cons um, of just freezing your eggs versus having the actual embryo? Um, it's a great question. I apologize. There's barking. That is my dog. <laughs> I've tried everything I can to keep them quiet, and it's just not working. So. The difference between, I would say the pros of freezing eggs, it, to start with that, really up until age 38, we think freezing eggs is equivalent to freezing embryos. Most studies tell us after age 38 is where embryo kind of takes the lead. The negative piece about freezing embryos is a couple of things. One, we can never unfertilize our eggs, so to speak. So once you have fertilized your eggs as embryos, God forbid something happens, let's say you're doing this with a partner, with that relationship, it really minimizes your capacity to use those. And so what we know is that more for women than for men, age is important. And so freezing eggs as eggs, I would say gives you the most reproductive potential. That is its main advantage. For women, as we get older, I'm not like a financial person, but like when you talk to financial people, they always talk about like diversifying. And I think that applies here too. Like you could freeze eggs and you can freeze embryos. So as we get into that, our later 30s, early 40s, where embryo has more effectiveness, we can freeze eggs for the potential future partner. We can consider things such as sperm donation if you're not partnered to create embryos so that you have that also as optimizing your opportunity. Thank you. Um, Amber, this might be a good question for you, but um, I'm happy to uh, give it to the doctors as well if um, you prefer. Um, how do you prepare your body prior to your egg retrieval? That's a great question. I mean, um, in terms of preparing your body to quiet your hormones, the physician will do, give you an individualized plan. So whether that be birth control to quiet your hormones um, or estrogen priming, where after you've ovulated, you take medication to quiet your hormones because after you're, you've ovulated, your body's beginning to think about the next cycle and thinking, hmm, what should I, what, what, am, what egg should become the next, the next one? And if we quiet it down during that uh, process, then it will be a little bit it's not as suppressive as, as birth control, but it will uh, quiet your hormones so that you'll be ready. So generally you'll have uh, one month so that the cycle before you actually start stimulation that we're using that cycle to quiet your hormones and get you ready for stimulation. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Burks, this question is for you. Um, if you currently have an IUD, how long do you need to wait to start the egg freezing process once it's removed? So really, if you're going to do egg freezing and you are not going to undergo a transfer um, right away, you do not have to necessarily have your Mirena removed. So we are able to stimulate your ovaries without taking your Mirena IUD out um, because we're not putting your you know, eggs or, you know, embryos back into your uterus. So when it's important to take your marina out would be before you are ready to undergo a transfer. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I have another question for Dr. Hirschfeld. Um, I was told that you lose four eggs in the thawing process. Is that true? 
so I would say we lose like a percentage of eggs in the thawing process. Um, and it sort of depends on the age you are when you freeze and where you go. So I, I'm not sure where the four number comes from. Um, I'd probably say no, whereas it's gonna be more of a percentage. So if you lose like somewhere five to 10%, depending on how old you are, it's more as you get older. Um, it's not gonna be a fixed number. It's gonna be a percentage of the eggs that you have. Great, thank you. Um, if, so this is for a doctor as well. Dr. Burks, if you wanna take this, um, when you're ready to conceive, should you try to get pregnant naturally or use your frozen eggs first? That's a great question. So um, I think Dr. Hirschfeld would agree with me. We would always um, advise you to try to conceive naturally first. Now, how long you should try before coming back in to see us and let us know you're trying is really dependent on your age. But we always say try to conceive. You might get pregnant very easily and not have an issue. And then perhaps when you're trying for baby number two, if you have difficulty, then you can use your eggs for baby number two. So we always would encourage you to try to conceive naturally first. Great. Um, I think this would be a good question for Dr. Hirschfeld. Um, how does genetic testing work with egg freezing? Can you do it with egg freezing and not just the embryo? So I would say there's sort of like two different types of genetic testing. And so one is looking to see if you're a carrier for the most commonly inherited illnesses. And so that's a blood test. So part of the testing we do, we really focus on the ovarian reserve testing, but we also do what I call preconception testing. So if egg freezing is the ultimate in preconception, we want to know factors that would impact downstream when you're really interested in being pregnant. And one of these is, are you a carrier for the most commonly inherited illnesses? Things like Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell. If you are, and your future partner is, then that embryo, when it's created, um, can theoretically be screened for that gene. So if we think of our DNA as like a thousand page, the seventh book of the Harry Potter series, and these letters are the DNA. If you're a carrier of like say Tay-Sachs, two letters got confused. Besides screening for those um, letters, so to speak, and we have to highlight in that book who that applies to. That's why you do that blood test before you're ready to have a family, either in the context of egg freezing or not, and potentially a partner does as well. And then embryos are screened for that. Or if we think of that same book, two huge books have to become one when egg and sperm combine. When those two books combine, the book chapters are like our chromosomes, and there's gonna be a mistake, an extra one or one too few. So screening for chromosome errors that can result in miscarriage and is the cause of things like Down syndrome also happens at the embryo. So some of it, in a sense, we can do blood testing for you to determine if that's something you're at risk for. That's that gene, like carrier testing. In the future, the level of genetic testing really happens at the level of the embryo. Again, for the chromosomes, because the mistake happens at fertilization. And even for the letters, the letters of our book, the DNA, it's because it matters if that embryo is a carrier in a sense of fault. So, so that's the level of where that genetic testing happens. Typically is actually Great, thank you. Um, Rose, this question is for you. Are there payment plans available for so everything? Here at FCI, we do not offer payment plans. What we do is we would team up with one of our um, vendors, the loan options, um, such as CAPEX or ALI. And that would be done with the patient as far as like completing an application. But here at FCI, we do not, um, for something of this size, we do not offer payment plans. Thank you. Um, so this question's for Dr. Burks Chapman. Um, is there a time frame to wait in between cycles or is it okay to have cycles, retrievals, back to back? Uh, so I think it uh, just depends on the end goal and how motivated you are and also time constraints. Um, but it is possible to do retrievals um, more closely together. Um, it's a protocol called Duostem. And I think it's a very individualized thing. So it's something that you would have to talk to your physician about to see if you're an appropriate candidate for that. Um, but you can also do a cycle, have a period, and then do another cycle. You don't necessarily always have to wait months in between cycles. Thank you. Um, 
We have another doctor question. Um, I, I think that the, that um, you would be the best um, perhaps resource for this, but anyone feel free to chime in. Um, what happens if you freeze your eggs and later need a surrogate or sperm? So I would say if you, when you freeze your eggs, if there's a thought in your mind, you may need a surrogate, there's actually a different level of testing that we do. It's called FDA testing. Um, so when it comes to knowing ahead of time, okay, I'm going to freeze my eggs and I have significant heart disease, so I know I will not be able to carry safely. I know I will have to go as a surrogate. There's actually different tests that you do to make your eggs, what's called FDA eligible, so that they're able to be created into embryos for a surrogate. Um, if that isn't known and something changes over the course of your life between when you freeze your eggs and you come to use the surrogate, then that testing couldn't have been known, so it wasn't done. So retroactively, in some cases, that type of testing is done for you and the sperm source. Identify a gestational carrier, sort of its own process. Um, for the ease of today, I, I think it's better to sort of as an individualized consult if those are questions that you're considering, but it's usually some at least a six month process to identify a gestational carrier. There are known and unknown carriers. So it's definitely feasible to do. Um, there's some additional testing. If this is something that someone knows already would be something that they would be considering. Thank you. Um, Dr. Burks, um, if someone has a longer cycle, um, say 32 days instead of 28 days, um, does it affect the timeline um, from the first day of the cycle to the retrieval? Uh, no, not typically. So first, even though 32 days does seem long, really any cycle length less than 35 days is still considered a normal cycle. Now, once we are stimulating your ovaries, we are controlling everything about your cycle. We're controlling the growth of your eggs, we're controlling your estrogen, you're coming back from monitoring and we're making dose adjustments based on what we see in your labs and your ultrasound. So we are controlling your cycle. So it's not going to be like a normal menstrual cycle. You will then not have your next period until after, you know, seven <coughs> to days after your retrieval. And that's because your hormones fall um, after we stop giving fertility medication. So it's, it doesn't um, really change the length of the stimulation and retrieval process. Thank you. Um, so going back to Dr. Hirschfeld, um, once you want to use your eggs, what do you, what happens? What do people have to do? Was there anything they should know about? So now is that time that we're preparing to be pregnant. So this is that, again, there's the preconception phase. So depending if you force your eggs with us or not, depending on some of this testing, things like your thyroid functions looked at, your vitamin D is looked at. We look at certain viral titers. Chicken pox and rubella, uniquely are viruses that can impact pregnant women. COVID has shown all of us that just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean you can't get the illness. So you wanna make sure you're vaccinated and you're immune or you need to be revaccinated. That carrier test that I was talking about, we do an assessment of the uterus now, which has not been a focus with egg freezing. And so there is some pre-testing. Physically to do the back end of this is how I think of it. Once the egg has been frozen, it's much less on you and your body. There's not necessarily the requirement for the same amount of injection medicines. We can even do something called a natural cycle frozen transfer. There is no anesthesia. The placement of the embryo occurs in what feels like a speculum exam. Really at the heart of what happens at the level of the lab. So the egg is thawed. It is fertilized with sperm of a partner or sperm donor. That is then developed to an embryo that is day five. And then that embryo is placed into your cavity. To facilitate that occurring in like a synced fashion, you've been on medicines for about two to three weeks to prepare your body to receive the embryo. Thank you. I'm going to do a couple more questions. We are coming close to our timing. Um, this one's for Rose. It's just a quick clarification about um, the difference between the cryopreservation fee and the egg storage fee. Um, is Do you have to pay for both is, is the question. You always have to pay for cryopreservation because that is a process um, in order to freeze the egg. The storage is if you have one cycle and you have your cryo and then storage, so you're paying both at the same time. If you come back for a second cycle, you still have to pay that cryo because that process is, is needed in order to treat and freeze the egg. 
but the storage you do not because we do put that into the same storage that you paid the first time. So the next time you would pay is a year after the first time that you paid for storage. Thank you. And just to, just to highlight, because Rose did such a great job with that slide, the initial price of egg freezing includes one year of storage. Correct. So all of this starts the next year, just to highlight that. Thank you for that clarification. And um, final question, something that I've seen um, a few times in our questions is, is there um, an age where it's really not, I'm losing my life, where it's really not um, a reality, a, a realistic, um, I guess, idea that um, you should freeze your eggs? I don't know if Dr. Burks or Dr. Hirschfeld, if you want to take that question, but is there, you know, a day, a, 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 an age where, um, you know, your eggs, you know, where, where it's not a good time to freeze your eggs anymore? Yeah, I, and Dr. Hirschfeld, please, you know, jump in, but I think that every doctor would always be willing, in most cases, even if you're 40, 41, to give you a chance, right? We want to see what your ovaries are doing because every woman is a little bit different. So I don't think we can give you 100% a, um, an age, but we also know that once you get to be 42 or older, the likelihood of you conceiving with your own eggs really um, decreases, unfortunately. So I think we would also be very honest with you about that because we don't want to mislead you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we are gonna wrap up our session for today. I wanna thank everyone who attended. Again, you will be receiving a recording of this presentation of the full webinar and um, I do encourage you when you get that email to look at it. And if you have any questions for Lila, who's, who was our patient who couldn't join us today, please submit them um, so that we can have her answer them for our blog and get those out to you. And um, if you still have any questions for our physicians, we do encourage you to schedule a consultation if you're a new patient or um, schedule an appointment, um, call um, your, um, existing physician if you're an existing patient. And we want to thank you again today. And we hope you enjoyed our webinar and hope you have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you.